This video will be a refutation of the idea that dinosaurs once existed with man and that there is archaeological and historical evidence for this claim. I most likely will not get to every single claim made by the film I am using. This is due to time constraint purposes. If a living, non-avian dinosaur was discovered, it would not disprove evolution. It would only be an anomaly. A creature we once believed was extinct, but we now know is not. It would be baffling, but would not be enough to topple the current model of Earth's history which is well established thanks to geology. To disprove evolution and the age of the Earth, one would need to disprove the billions of years of strata and the entire fossil record as well as evidence from genetics that all living things are related. Even if the creatures described in this video are dinosaurs, they do not have to be living dinosaurs. They could be fossils discovered by ancient men who needed an explanation. The ancient Scythians of Central Asia discovered protoceratops skeletons in the desert, leading to legends of griffins. The ancient Greeks on the islands of Malta, Crete, etc. would have found the skulls of dwarf, now extinct mammoths, which even a modern man would probably confuse for a cyclops. But rest assured that none of the dinosaur claims I will analyze in this video are dinosaurs in any way. To the creationist viewer who is watching this, I hope you will realize I am analyzing these claims honestly and without bias. The video itself speaks about how dragons of ancient lore were inspired by dinosaurs. We will see how the film fails to cite reliable sources and has illustrations that are outdated and do not even pertain to the topic being spoken about. Many of the claims are either hoaxes or misinterpretations of information with better explanations. I will be citing my sources directly in the video. Whenever I make a claim I want you to check, you will see a large number in the lower right hand corner of the video. This will refer to a footnote in a Google Doc I will put the link to in the description. The doc will be open to the public and will have a note with a full citation next to it for your convenience. Scripts are also available upon request. Also for your convenience, I try to keep all my sources internet based and accessible to all people while still retaining reliability. I hope you understand I researched these claims extensively and a lot of effort went into analyzing these claims as well as providing you, the viewer, with the resources needed to check my facts. Even though I did not have the time to go over all the claims in the video, I hope you believe I chose well out of the numerous given and that I thoroughly debunked the most important and widely cited pieces of evidence for dinosaurs coexisting with man. Without further ado, let's get to our first claim. A well-known old science book, the Historia Animalium, claims that dragons were not extinct in the 1500s, but the animals were said to be extremely rare and relatively small by then. The Historia Animalium, or the History of Animals, is a five-volume encyclopedia of animals compiled from 1551 to 1558 by Conrad Gessner, a doctor in the city of Zurich. The encyclopedia is over 3,500 pages and is definitely aimed for scholars, not students. Gessner's encyclopedia goes very in-depth into common creatures, such as lions, mythical creatures, such as unicorns, and foreign creatures to Europeans, such as the armadillo numerous animals found in Gesner's book. However, it is important to know many of Gesner's images do not derive from his own observations. For example, sea monsters were taken from maps by Swedish writer Olaus Magnus, hyenas from classical author Opian, even reporting he had never seen a live chrysotis or hamster, but that he had seen a pelt. In some cases, this can result in the creation of fictional creatures, such as the toucan. Using a single beak sent by Giovanni Ferrario and geographer André Thebes' Les Singularités de la France Antarctique, he created the Pica Brasilica, a fictional bird which was based on the toucan. The rhinoceros in Gesner's book was copied from Albrecht Dürer, but also refers to another painting of a rhinoceros certified by a scholar which he used as a source. Gliss, or Dormouse, was based off a picture sent to him by a physician at Bergamo. Conrad Putinger's a politician from Germany sent Gesner a picture of a bird of paradise and reported that one was on sale at Nuremberg for 800 talents. That said, provided are images by Gesner of dragons. A similar animal known as the basilisk in the book is another serpentine animal shown. Since we know Gesner usually derived images of exotic creatures from dead specimens or existing drawings, let's see what Gesner himself has to say about his basilisk and dragons. 
The apothecaries and vagabonds sculpt the bodies of the rays in various forms of their own pleasing by cutting, bending, and splitting into the forms of snakes, basilisks, and dragons. One of these forms is depicted here, so these frauds and swindles shall be found out. I have seen a vagabond here who has shown such a form pretending it was a basilisk, but it was all made of a ray. Gesner here admits to one crucial fact. The basilisk is the result of a mutilated stingray corpse that was sold as a basilisk. Dried snakes, flying fishes, and rays could be confused at any time on a renaissance market for dragons and basilisk, even to a professional eye like Gesner's. This would explain why Gesner's dragons, conveniently grouped with serpents, are smaller than those of medieval lore. In 1572, a scientist named Ulysses Aldrovandus carefully described a small dragon seen along a farm road in northern Italy. The rare creature was killed by the farmer when he struck it on the head with his walking stick. Aldrovandus obtained the dead body and made measurements and a drawing. He even had the animal mounted for a museum. It had a long neck, a very long tail, and a fat body. The skeletons of a number of ancient reptile-like creatures called Tenostropius have similarities to the basic description that he gave. Ulissi Andrivandi was an Italian naturalist from Bologna in the 1500s and 1600s. Aldrovandi wrote hundreds of texts on natural history and without a doubt was interested in animals. He describes many monsters and mythical creatures in his books most prominently Monstrorum Historia dating back to 1642. What about this claim that Aldrovandi discovered a Tanistrophius, which was stuffed and recorded? I can't find or confirm the picture used in the video online, so we'll have to look through the internet for similar pictures. First, let's see what makes Tanistrophius what it is. Tanistrophius lived in the Middle Triassic around 240 million years ago, most well known for its incredible neck measuring about 3 meters with an overall body length of 4.5 meters. It had combed teeth and probably ate fish, which we know because of stomach remains. There are no fins on the back of the Tanistrophius, nor are there any signs of other appendages along the back of the animal. Now on page 156 of Charles Gould's 1886 book Mythical Monsters, we see two dragons drawn by Aldrovandus, both two-legged, and one winged. Neither of these could be the four-legged Tanistrophius. The neck, which is supposed to be longer than the rest of the body combined, is not long enough. Besides, Mythical Monsters is an outdated book with no scientific value anymore. A paper in the Annals of Science confirms that Aldrovandi did have a dead body of a dragon in his private collection, but also confirms that it is a hoax, made when a European grass snake was given the limbs of a common toad. The paper states that Renaissance animal hoaxes can be divided into two groups, the Jenny Hanovers, or mutilated corpses of fishes and rays, and the composite parts of various animals which could be put together to form a completely new but fake creature. Notice how Gesner's basilisks and flying serpents fall into the former category, while Aldrovandi's Tanistrophius falls into the latter. One dragon story from the ancient land of Sumer, in Babylon, tells of the hero Gilgamesh. He decided to make a name for himself by traveling to a distant land to cut great cedar trees needed for his city. He reached the forest with 50 volunteers and discovered a huge reptile-like animal which ate trees and reeds. The story simply says that Gilgamesh killed it and cut off its head for a trophy. The Epic of Gilgamesh, perhaps the earliest known work of written fiction, is a series of poems in ancient Sumer dating back to around 2700 BCE, compiled into 12 tablets, all written in the Sumerian form of writing called cuneiform. Regardless of whether or not it was based on a true story, the text is cited in the film and it would be best to take a look at it. Note that the translation states that many of the lines are missing, so we have an incomplete text. The name of the monster, Humbaba, is mentioned 43 times in the text. In Tablet 2, it is stated that Humbaba's roar is a flood, his mouth is fire, and his breath is death. This seems like a generic large monster, but we need a physical description. In Tablet 3, it states, Until he goes away and returns, until he reaches the cedar forest, until he kills Humbaba the Terrible, suggesting Humbaba lives, as stated in the film, as living in large forest of cedar. The action doesn't begin until Tablet 5, where we see something that strikes a blow against the belief that Humbaba is a dinosaur. He talks. 
whom Baba himself says, an idiot and a moron should give advice to each other, whom Baba is described as begging for his life, saying, you are young yet, Gilgamesh, your mother gave birth to you. Also, Humbaba can change his face, as we see when Enkidu says, My friend, Humbaba's face keeps changing. Afterwards, Gilgamesh kills Humbaba. Tablet 4 states Humbaba has seven layers of armor, when Shamish, the Sumerian sun god, states he has not put on his seven coats of armor. He is only wearing one, but has taken off six. What type of dinosaur has removable armor? A verse in Tablet 2 states that it was the chief god, Enlil, who assigned Humbaba to protect the cedar forest. In order to keep the cedar safe, Enlil assigned him as a terror to human beings. All we know is that Humbaba is a guardian spirit assigned by gods, and there is no specific expected physical description of him. However, from what we've seen, we can prove Humbaba is no dinosaur, but rather a supernatural being. Also, Ancient carvings of Humbaba depict him as more humanoid than reptilian. One legend tells about a famous Chinese man named Yu. The story says after the great worldwide flood, Yu surveyed the land of China and divided it into sections. He built channels to drain the water off to the sea and help make the land livable again. Many snakes and dragons were driven off from the marshlands when Yu created the new farmlands. Yu the Great was a Chinese emperor said to have reigned in the Han Dynasty, the legendary oldest civilization of China beginning around 2070 BCE, long before any written record of Chinese history. In fact, many scholars are unsure that the Xia Dynasty existed, as the oldest dynasties we can confirm exist, the Zhou and Shang make no mention of it. This alone is enough to disprove the claim that Yu the Great ever existed. If the Xia Dynasty did exist, however, we would have to explain why there is a distinction made between snakes and dragons. The dragon, as many Chinese animals, was never classified into a taxonomically sound group of animals. The dragon is mostly mentioned in legends and rituals. The Chinese dragon is without a doubt reptilian, and at its most basic resembles a crocodile more than a dinosaur. Chinese dragons usually have their legs sprawling outward, like that of a crocodile or lizard. True dinosaurs have their legs directly beneath their bodies. So what was the Chinese dragon? An important clue could be that the Chinese dragon was associated with water, appearing in the form of water spouts and swirling waves. Book 3, Chapter 9 of The Works of Mencius describes how Yu drove away the snakes and dragons and forced them into grassy marshes. This would make the Chinese alligator, now an endangered species, the most likely explanation for the Chinese dragon. The names for dragons and crocodilians constantly overlapped in Chinese writing, and even today in Anhui, alligators are referred to as Tulong and Helong, earth and river dragons. Water vapor has been observed issuing from the mouths of the closely related American alligators, and a drawing by William Bartram even shows alligators exhaling smoke. Alligators are also very loud creatures, emitting loud, deep bellows during mating season. Rice cultivation would have brought farmers in proximity to the alligators, whose loud bellows during the rainy season would have sparked a connection between these reptiles and the rain, eventually stylized into the Chinese dragon. Some old Chinese books even tell of a family that kept dragons and raised them to use their blood and body parts for medicines. As I stated earlier, the legends of Chinese dragons are more than likely based on the Chinese alligator, which were eventually stylized to the point where they were purely mythical creatures. This legend comes from the Xia dynasty, which we must be skeptical about because there was no evidence it even occurred. I found information on this legend on page 50 of The Dragon in China and Japan by W. M. Divisor. It states that heaven sent down two dragons, a female and a male. One of his descendants was Liu Lei, who from the Dragon Rear family learned to tame dragons. So the story is true. Dragons were said to have been raised by Chinese people. A consistent theme in dragon mythology is that dragons are either a good or bad omen. They are signs of events yet to come and are given a supernatural, demonic, or angelic status, which would explain why they are often exaggerated in Chinese literature. It was said in the year 926, the evening a star fell before the emperor's tent, the emperor saw a, quote, yellow dragon coiling and winding about one mile in length. Even if this was a dinosaur, it would not fit the description because it describes the animal as coiling and winding, suggesting it was more serpentine than quadrupedal. Secondly, the animal is said to be a mile, or about 1,609 meters. 
the longest dinosaur ever known, Amphicelius regillimus, which doesn't even have a complete skeleton, is estimated to be at most 58 meters long. Most Chinese dragon tales are not meant to be taken as literal fact. They are meant to be taken as omens of either good or bad events. The story of Lu Lei and his dragons ends with the emperor, Kung Kia, eating the female dragon and dying afterwards as a bad omen. The film goes on to describe the title of Royal Dragon Feeder, which apparently means dragons or dinosaurs were alive at the time because someone had to feed them. There aren't any journals or books on the topic I've been able to find, and only two seemingly unprofessional articles shed any light on this without making any extraordinary creationist claim. These websites state that the Royal Dragon Feeder meant someone would throw food for dragons as an offering into a sacred dragon pond. Neither article provides a citation for this, meaning that either this theory is true, or the royal dragon feeder claim is fabricated. Nobody provides a reliable source for this, and creationist sites fail to recognize that dragons are supernatural in Chinese lore. An Irish writer recorded an encounter with a large beast with iron-like spikes on its tail, which pointed backwards. Its head had the shape of a horse's, and it had thick legs with strong claws. The dragon in Celtic lore is a symbol of bad luck. When dragons appear in the dreams of King Arthur, he begins to lose to his opponent Mordred in battle. When a dragon finally devours Arthur, he is killed by Mordred. Dragons were also said to have been signs of infertility. Every May 1st, two dragons could be heard screaming on the island of Britain, bringing infertility. Unlike when we were dealing with China, however, I cannot find any original source or writing dealing with a dragon similar to a stegosaurus meaning the legend is most likely fabricated. The only lead we have is whether or not Irish dragons could fit the description of the stegosaurus, with large legs, plates on their back, and spikes on their tail. The romance of Tristan and Isilt, a famous Irish legend about two lovers, gives the description of a classic Irish dragon dating back to around 1000 or 1100, a century or two after the supposed stegosaurus. If you want to take a look at the text yourself, it is part of the Project Gutenberg collection of ebooks available online. The first mention of a dragon is when a woman describes a dragon which has eaten a maiden. In its claws, it devoured her. The stegosaurus is an herbivorous dinosaur eating plants. A few lines later, it describes the dragon as having, quote, the head of a bear and red eyes like coals of fire and hairy tufted ears, lion's claws, a serpent's tail, and a griffin's body. The stegosaurus definitely does not have a bear's head, nor the lean body of a griffin or the claws of a lion. Most importantly, the author describes the griffin as having the tail of a serpent without the mention of the spikes or thagomizer on its tail. Finally, the dragon vomited from his nostrils two streams of loathsome flames. No dragon was ever believed to have breathed fire. The Pists of Ireland, as well as the wyverns of the British Isles, bear more resemblance to snakes and eels than actual dinosaurs. Finally, in the Celtic Iron Age, there are no legends of dragons, and archaeologists believe the dragon legend was introduced to Ireland by Greeks and Romans. The respected Greek explorer and historian Herodotus described small flying reptiles in ancient Egypt and Arabia. These animals sound amazingly like the small pterodactyl, Rhamphorhynchus. They had the same snake-like body and bat-like wings. Many had been killed near the city of Buto in Arabia. He was shown a canyon with many piles of their backbones and ribs. Herodotus said that these animals could sometimes be found in the spice groves. They were small in size and of various colors. Large numbers would sometimes gather in the frankincense trees. The name given to these creatures is stated in one of my earliest videos on Greek mythology. They are called Ophis terotoi, which generically translates to winged serpents. There is no special name for these creatures. In Book 2, Chapter 7, verses 1 to 4 of Herodotus' Histories, he states, There is a place in Arabia, not far from the town of Buto, where I went to learn about the winged serpents. When I arrived there, I saw innumerable bones and backbones of serpents, many heaps of backbones, great and small and even smaller. This place where the backbones lay scattered is where a narrow mountain pass opens into a great plain, which adjoins the plain of Egyptos. Winged serpents are said to fly from Arabia at the beginning of spring, making for Egypt, but the ibis birds encounter the invaders in this pass and kill them. 
The Arabians say that the ibis is greatly honored by the Egyptoi for the service, and the Egyptoi give the same reason for honoring these birds. To summarize, Herodotus went to the town of Buto in Egypt, where he was shown skeletons of winged serpents native to Arabia. Apparently, they are pests because the ibis is honored because it kills them. Herodotus then describes how the snakes were produced. When they copulate, while the male is in the act of procreation and as soon as he has ejaculated his seed, the female seizes him by the neck and does not let go until she has bitten through. The male dies in the way described, but the female suffers in return for the male the following punishment. Avenging their father, the young, while they are still within the womb, gnaw at their mother, and eating through her bowels, thus make their way out. In a similar way to the black widow and praying mantis, the father is said to die immediately after mating, and the mother is then eaten alive by her offspring. Herodotus never claims to see a live serpent, only their bones. He knows the snakes are feared in Arabia because they guard the myrrh groves. This is a true mystery unlike the other claims made by creationists because this is actually confirmed by Herodotus. We know the ibis existed and was honored in the form of the god Jehuti, or Thoth in Egypt. More importantly than Herodotus, King Asarhaddon of Assyria, who conquered Egypt in 671 BCE, arriving centuries before Herodotus, described yellow snakes with wings in the Sinai. Karen Radner of University College London confirms all of this. There's two proposed explanations we have to discount. Draco Volans, a flying lizard found in Southeast Asia, and Spinosaurus bones, which are too large. Perhaps the most reasonable explanation is Maktesh Raman, or Wadi Ruman, a crater in Israel 85 kilometers south of Beersheba. Romans, Nabataeans, and other traders around the time of Herodotus built trade routes going around and through the crater, making it a well-known spot in the classical Middle East. As a result of tourism, many of the fossils are no longer visible or have been damaged, but in ancient times fossils would have been easily visible. Finally, there is a location called Amphibian Hill southwest of the crater, known for its fossils of amphibians with fossils of yellow coloration, explaining Asarhaddon's yellow snake. The fossil of a salamander such as Ramanellus longispinus, the legged snakes Pachyrhachus problematicus, and Hasiophis terrasanctus could easily be confused for a winged snake in the eyes of ancient people. In Pliny's book, Natural History, written around 70 AD, he says, Africa produces elephants, but it is India that produces the largest, as well as the dragon. Claudius Elians, a Greek military writer of the second century who wrote De Natura Animalium around 200 AD, in his work stated, The Phrygian history also states that dragons are born which reach 10 paces in length. 10 paces, that's about 30 feet. Claudius Aelianus or Aelian was a Roman author and teacher who lived from 175 to 235 CE. De Natura Animalium or On the Nature of Animals was written by him and in Book 6, Chapter 1, he does describe the dragon as Concealed in the trees, covers up the tail half of its body with foliage and lets the forepart hang down like a rope. And when the elephant comes along, it darts at its eyes and tears them out and then, encircling its neck, lashes at it with its tail and suffocates it in this uncommon and novel kind of news. Alien 621 also describes dragons or dracons as being constrictors that eat elephants in India. Alien describes one Indian dragon as being 140 cubits kept by Abyssaris the Indian. 140 cubits is probably an exaggeration that is equal to 210 feet or 64 meters as would the statement that elephants were eaten. Pliny the Elder also describes similar dragons from India. Pliny states that India, quote, produces the largest elephants as well as the largest dragons, and, just like Alien, describes them as eating elephants and being serpentine in nature, hanging from trees like ropes. These records describe the, quote, dragons as hanging like ropes, and nowhere does it even describe them as having legs of any type. It would make much more sense to associate these dragons with the Asian rock python, a large species of constrictor snake found in India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Indonesia, and other parts of Southeast Asia. It is usually divided into two subspecies, the Indian rock python and the Burmese python. The Indian subspecies rarely reaches 3.7 meters in length but can exceed 6 meters in length and 55 kilograms. The reticulated python, one of the largest snakes in the world, also lives in Southeast Asia, its westernmost range being in Bangladesh 
weighing up to 136 kilograms and going up to 8.5 meters in length. The dragons of India, described by Ilion and Pliny, appear to be large pythons. The city of Neuerlich in France was renamed in honor of the killing of a dragon there. This animal was reported to be bigger than an ox and had long, sharp, pointed horns on its head. The life of St. Martha was first written between 1187 and 1212 and describes the event cited in the film. It describes how St. Martha visited the city of Nerluk along the Rhone, which was terrorized by a dragon. The dragon was, quote, fatter than an ox, longer than a horse, with a lion's face and head, teeth as sharp as swords, a horse's mane, its back as sharp as an axe, bristling and piercing scales, six feet with bear's claws, a serpent's tail, and a shell on either side like a tortoise. This dragon was known as the Tarasque. Two details prove this creature is purely mythological, the shell and the six legs. While some members of the Thyreophora class of dinosaurs, such as Ankylosaurus, have shell-like structures, no known dinosaur or any large animal known right now is a hexapod with six legs. Even if the Tarasque was an Ankylosaur, it was described as eating a man it had throttled. All Ankylosaurs were strictly herbivorous. If you have any doubts about this, there are numerous Tarasque sculptures in the city of Tarascon because Nerluk was renamed Tarascon in honor of the killing of the dragon. Alexander the Great reported that when he conquered parts of what is now India in 326 BC, his soldiers were scared by great dragons that lived in caves. We've already gone over how Claudius Aelians and Pliny the Elder described pythons, not dinosaurs, so we can skim over Alexander the Great very quickly. We return to Aliens on Animals, or Denature Animalium, where it says in Book 16, Chapter 3, quote, There were in India two Draconis, serpent dragons, kept by Abyssarius the Indian, and that one of them measured 140 cubits, the other 80. He, Onesicritos, says also that Alexandros had a great desire to see them. This is all the information given to the dragon specifically seen by Alexander. There is no reason to believe Alien was describing a different dragon than the ones he was describing earlier. Not to mention that these dragons are 65.1 and 37.2 meters, or 213.5 and 122 feet respectively, far too long to be any serpent, or any dinosaur for that matter, proving these legends were either fabricated or exaggerated. These stone carvings, which are known as the Ica stones, are an enigma. There have been over 16,000 of these remarkable stones found over the past 50 years. They contain images of daily life, battle scenes, agriculture practices, medical procedures, advanced technologies, and most amazingly, dinosaurs. Many skeptics have tried to debunk the Ica stones by saying that they are a modern day creation, but the evidence indicates differently. The story begins in 1966 when Peruvian physician Dr. Javier Cabrera Darquea received a pre-Incan carving of what he claimed was a prehistoric fish. He began collecting such stones, gaining more than 300 from two brothers who collected artifacts and by the 1970s had over 11,000 from a farmer named Basilio Uchuya, who claimed he found them along the Ica River, refusing to reveal the exact location. Dr. Cabrera says the Ico stones can provide us with great insight into the origins of mankind and a secret history of ancient people. The Ica stones allegedly depict advanced surgery, brain transplants, telescopes, dragons, and most importantly, dinosaurs being hunted and ridden. Because the stones are so controversial and we know they exist, I will take a look at the claims that the stones are genuine and that they are not and come to a conclusion. Those who are arguing the Ico stones are genuine give the following reasons they are real. It is said that a father, Simon, who served under Francisco Pizarro found the stones in 1535 Peru, sending a few of them back to Spain. The stones show no signs of being polished or carved. One source states the stones, which weigh up to 1,000 pounds, could not be lifted by poor people, not to mention the total of 15,000 stones would be too hard to forge. The quarry where such stone would be quarried from should be easily found, but there is no such quarry found. Finally, Uchoya did confess that the stones were a hoax, but in an interview later states he only did so to avoid the Peruvian law, which bans the illegal trade of ancient artifacts. However, I can't find a source on a father Simon dating back to colonial Spain. Otherwise, all of these are reasonable claims in favor of the Ica stones. Evidence against the stones, however, piles much higher. Firstly, when Uchoya and Cabrera were confessing to authorities that the stones were hoaxes, 
They revealed that they could create perfect replicas of the stones using sandpaper and a dental drill. The old rustic archaic coloring was created after placing the graved stones in chicken pens to get scratched. Uchuya then stated that he got the images of dinosaurs from 1960s and 70s books, which is evident because we now know dinosaurs are not as bulky and reptilian as depicted in the Ica stones. The fact that Cabrera and Uchuya were capable of making the Ica stones is more than reasonable in them finding remnants of ancient civilizations and is enough to debunk the Ica stones. Whether or not you believe some are fake or all are fake, there is no denying that the dinosaurs and medical extremes depicted are frauds. Anyone who wishes to dispute this further can call for a dating of the stones, which is pretty much impossible, whether you use carbon dating or the strata the rocks were found in. Carbon dating is only possible if there is organic material, which there is none of. Since Uchuya never revealed the location of the stones, we will never know where the stones are from. If you use the date as the ultimate judge of whether or not the stones are real, we can never be sure. The fact that Cabrera and Uchuya were capable of forging the stones is overwhelming evidence that the stones are indeed frauds. In Acambero, Mexico, since the 1960s, over 56,000 ancient clay figurines have been discovered. Many of these clay artifacts are sculptures of dinosaurs. The approximate age of these clay figures is around 4,500 years old. Many people have studied these figures and the opinion of their authenticity is divided. Most who have no preconceived biases believe that they are genuine, but others who believe that the dinosaurs died off millions of years ago state that they remain skeptical in spite of the radiocarbon dating and investigative evidence that points to their authenticity. The Akambara figures were discovered in 1944 and 1945 by German merchant Waldemar Jolsurud, who discovered them at the foot of El Toro Mountain near Akambaro, Mexico. Over 32,000 clay figures are claimed to have been found in the area which are cited as depicting dinosaurs. These artifacts are numerous, but are they legitimate? Patina, the thin layer of tarnish that forms as rock or metal is exposed to oxygen, should be present on these artifacts assuming they are as old as some believe. The Akambaro figures lack patina, the first sign that they are recently made. Secondly, the Akambaro figures are very fragile and delicate clay figures. It is hard but not impossible to believe that thousands of such artifacts remained undamaged after thousands of years. Finally, we get to the dating of these artifacts. Since we can't use carbon dating as the Akambaro figures don't have organic material, scientists have used thermoluminescence or TL dating to date the figures. Very simply put, TL dating involves analyzing the amount of trapped electrons of long-lived isotopes of heavy elements such as uranium, thorium, and potassium in minerals, most likely quartz sand. Using TL dating, you can learn about when sedimentary rock first underwent deposition, or in this case, burial. Between 1969 and 1972, Mexico City's Museo Nacional used TL dating, which was very young and a recent development at the time, dating a collection of these artifacts to 2500 BCE. In 1978, however, when TL dating became more efficient, scientists dated the Akambaro figures again and were unable to even produce a date because they were either too recent to undergo the dating process or were never even buried at all. The most likely explanation is that farmers forged these clay artifacts to be sold to tourists as legitimate artifacts. This 12th century Cambodian temple, constructed in 1186 AD, is home to a very interesting dinosaur artifact. The temple is covered with ornate designs and stone carvings on its exterior. This carving of a stegosaurus-like dinosaur was found on the temple wall. The stegosaur dinosaur mentioned is a very famous carving at the Cambodian temple known today as Ta Pram in the ancient city of Angkor. The carving shown here does resemble a stegosaurus at first appearance. If the carving is legitimate, it would mean dinosaurs did live in the area and at its prime as the Hindu temple Raja Vihara around 1100 or 1200 millions of people would have been living within the vicinity. After the fall of the Khmer Empire around 1500, which built Ta Pram, the temple was reclaimed by nature until it was rediscovered. The bas-relief of the animal is not uncommon. There are bas-relief carvings of birds, monkeys, and buffalo throughout Ta Pram. The stegosaurus is the only such carving in the entire complex. Some suggest that the carving is a hoax, a recent addition to the temple, but this is highly controversial. There is patina on the stegosaurus, and the carving style is similar to the other carvings in the area. Assuming the carving is not a hoax, it doesn't seem like a stegosaurus after examination for two main reasons. Stegosaurus did not have protrusions coming out of its head as this animal does, whether they're horns or ears. Also, the stegosaurus lacks the thagomizer or tail spikes as I discussed earlier, which are found in stegosaurs. 
The back plates of the Stegosaurus are lobes that are found in other carvings on the temple, such as this bird and what appears to be a lizard or crocodile here. Once you remove the lobes, which appear to be purely for decoration and most likely represent vegetation, you are left with an animal that bears striking resemblance to many animals nearby. Among these are the Sumatran rhinoceros and Javan rhinoceros, both now very endangered. Here's another explanation. As I stated much earlier in the video, dinosaur bones would not have been amazingly hard to come over in ancient times. The griffin was most likely inspired by the protoceratops of Mongolia, and the cyclopes by the skulls of dwarf elephants on islands such as Crete and Malta. Who's to say ancient people were not inspired by dinosaur bones and came up with a dragon? Thyreophorans such as Tuajangosaurus, Huayangosaurus, Chungkingosaurus, Chelingosaurus, and Warhosaurus were all common stegosaurs from China, which was very close to the Khmer Empire. Many other ancient cultures throughout history have given us artwork, sculptures, and artifacts that point to the existence of dinosaurs. The first artifact shown is the Narmer palette, carved from a single block of dark green schist depicting the unification of Egypt around 3200 BCE by the legendary Narmer. At the center of the backside of the seal, we see the sauropods described, two creatures known as serpopods with intertwined necks. Let's take a look at these serpopards, the important thing to focus on. Look at how the serpopards are being handled by two people of similar size to Narmer. This is important because aside from the pharaoh Narmer, nobody is depicted as being his size. Size here is important because it is a status symbol in Egyptian art, and thus Narmer himself is depicted as being gigantic. The serpopards here probably represent political movement and Narmer's ability to crush opposition. The term serpopard is a new term and the ancient term is lost. However, we can see they are clearly feline because of the head of the serpopard and the heads of lions, cats, and leopards in Egyptian art. Another similar palette is the two dogs palette, which depicts on the front side two serpopards which are not leashed and appear to be licking a dead animal, possibly a deer or ibex. These serpopards are not intertwining their necks but rather form the rim. On the obverse, we see three strange figures, another serpopard, a griffin, and a musician who appears to be a human-jackal hybrid. All three of, are of similar size and the entire palette is a mess. We see pure chaos, ibexes, lions, giraffes, and rams attacking each other out of order. The front side shows perfect order with lions and jackals attacking rams and ibexes, all in the order of nature with the serpopards larger than the rest. The palettes depict two conditions of a stable dynasty, one with serpopards as bringers of political disorder, the Narmer palette, and one showing them as keepers of order, the two dogs palette. It is a symbol with two meanings, political disorder and natural order, not a dinosaur. At Bridges National Monument in Utah, the Anazazi Indians made this cave drawing several thousand years ago. Looking at the original carving, not the enhanced version, the dinosaur is very vague and blurry. It is actually called Dinosaur 1. Dinosaur 1 was discovered on Kachina Bridge, an immense sandstone archway over 60 meters high. Navajo, Ute, and other Pueblos made carvings in the area as early as 1000 BCE. Under careful examination, however, Dinosaur 1 is not a single carving at all. The so-called head, neck, and torso are a single curve while the tail is a second curve. There is a triangle on the back of Dinosaur 1 as well, which gives it a dorsal fin. Finally, the legs of the dinosaur are not part of the carving. They are actually mud stains or a lighter colored mineral that stained the rock. There are three other alleged dinosaurs described at Kachina Bridge. Beneath Dinosaur 1, there is, of course, Dinosaur 2. Dinosaur 2 is directly beneath Dinosaur 1 and is allegedly a second sauropod but is a mineral stain or a mud stain on the rock. The opposite wall has Dinosaurs 3 and 4. Dinosaur 3 is allegedly a triceratops but it has 8 legs that don't even connect to the body. The head looks nothing like that of a ceratopsian. Dinosaur looks nothing at all like any known dinosaur and is more like a pooping mountain goat. Let's look at some other carvings. At Havasupai Canyon in Arizona, an alleged Edmontosaurus carving was found and in the creationist book The Great Dinosaur Mystery is compared to an outdated Edmontosaurus drawing by none other than creationist Paul Taylor. Taylor's drawing looks nothing at all like a real Edmontosaurus as Taylor's has two stubby arms and an incorrectly drawn neck and head. We now know that the carving without the outline and even with the outline looks nothing at all like Edmontosaurus, which lifted its tail and was most likely quadrupedal, walking on four legs. The quote Edmontosaurus is most likely either an eagle petroglyph here compared to an eagle petroglyph from the Grand Canyon or a depiction of a collared lizard. The Bible describes six different creatures that fit the description of what we call a dinosaur. They are dragon, 
flying serpent, fiery serpent, leviathan, cockatrice, and behemoth. For time constraint purposes, I won't be going over all of the references to dinosaurs in the Bible, but rather the ones the video describes. The King James Bible is available online and there are multiple references to dragons and serpents. Exegesis analysis of the Bible involves literary criticism of the Bible and analysis in different forms. There is no scientific method for interpreting the Bible. However, we can determine what an author meant in literary terms. The Bible is open to interpretation and context is key in finding the meaning of a text. Let's do a quick rundown of the ways we will be able to interpret the Bible. Literary means we will be reading the Bible as if it is a storybook, taking each verse literally and interpreting it as pure truth and nothing less. Whatever was described, was described. Artistic or aesthetic interpretation is similar to an artist's impression of a work, involving the stressing of details, even if exaggerated, to convey imagery. Theological is an attempt to explain God, the nature of God, and the nature of religion. This is where we will take into account the Psalms and the Proverbs. Ascetical interpretation, not to be confused with aesthetic interpretation, is the interpretation in the sense that it will help you overcome worldly desires. Parables fall under this category. Finally, mystical interpretation involves looking through the Bible through a prophetic and spiritual sense, as in the book of Revelation. These forms of interpretation can overlap, but for the most part are distinct, which is why I will keep them separate. In Numbers 21.6, the King James Bible states, and the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Now what are the fiery serpents described? Fiery can be a term to describe their attitude, meaning quick-tempered. This sounds like a much more logical explanation than a literal snake on fire or a dinosaur. The Palestine saw-scaled viper fits the description of a fiery serpent very well, and we should keep this in mind. Saw-scaled vipers are considered one of the world's most venomous snakes, are found in the Middle East, bite with little provocation and cause the largest fraction of all snake bite fatalities in humans. Next we have Deuteronomy 8.15, which states, Who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water? Who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint? Again, this seems to be an allusion to the Palestinian saw-scaled viper. There is no reason to believe it is anything else. Psalm 44.19 is, Though thou hast sore broken us in the place of dragons and covered us with the shadow of death. If the passage is literal, then it is the jackal, a species of wild dog. To any doubters, the word tanium or tanion is used most often in the Bible to describe dragons. Tanim and tanion are very similar words with similar and practically interchangeable meanings, and can mean a wide variety of creatures causing problems in translation. Tanim can also be directed to a root which means to howl, and iim, the suffix added to tanim and tanin, in some cases, means wolf. Most cases referring to dragons in the Bible are jackals, wolves, or other canids. Lamentations 4.3 describes the animal as having breasts and giving milk, something only mammals can do. The King James Bible loses its scientific credibility here at the mention of sea monsters giving milk, unless they are talking about cetaceans such as whales and dolphins. Isaiah 14.19 states, Rejoice not thou, whole Palestina, because the rod of him that smote thee is broken. For out of the serpent's rod shall come forth a cockatrice, and his fruit shall be a fiery serpent. Isaiah 36 says, The burden of the beasts of the south into the land of trouble and anguish, from whence come the young and old lion, the viper and fiery flying serpent. They will carry their riches upon the shoulders of young asses and their treasures upon the bunches of camels, to a people that shall not profit them. Here we have two supposed dinosaurs, the cockatrice and the fiery serpent. The previous verse states that Isaiah 14.29 is an oracle, a prophecy delivered after the reign of King Ahaz of Judah. The next king, Hezekiah, witnessed the fall of Judah at the hands of Babylonians. The fruit seems to convey the image of a heritage being passed down, perhaps in the form of kingship as the Assyrians came to take Jerusalem. Isaiah 36 is subject to interpretation. It describes a treaty with Egypt by the Israelites in an attempt to save them from invaders. The beasts of the south appear to be Egyptians, and the people who they will not profit from are the Israelites, who are conquered regardless of what Egypt did. The rest of the animals appear to be artistic descriptions of the land between the two, Sinai. It is understandable why Sinai is so dramatized in the Bible considering the history the Jews had with it. All of these animals, no matter how rare, would be found in the Iron Age Sinai. 
Jeremiah 8.17, Jeremiah 9.11, Jeremiah 14.6, and Mika 1.8 all describe jackals because of the translation of the word tanim. Only Jeremiah 51.34 is something distinct in describing the ability of a snake to unhook its jaw. When you actually look at the Bible, you see none of the claims I described are dinosaurs. We see they are either snakes or jackals. The behemoth and leviathan are mentioned in a speech made by God in the book of Job where a wealthy man named Job is humbling himself before God after losing everything he had. God gives Job a speech boasting about his power and his authority. Let's start with the behemoth mentioned in chapter 40 of the book of Job. Pause if you must so you can read it. Let's look at these claims to see what the behemoth is. Verse 15 says it eats a grass like an ox, making it a grazer. The necks of sauropods such as Apatosaurus and Diplodocus are, according to a study in the journal Science, now known to be more useful for grazing than eating like a giraffe, while most sauropod dinosaurs, with the exception of Camarasaurs and Brachiosaurs, most likely got their energy feeding off low-lying plants and not trees as many outdated books describe. It wouldn't be far-fetched to say sauropods fed this way. Elephants, however, one animal scholars associate with the behemoth, while not predominantly a grazer, is known to find food in virtually all habitats, so it grazes when it must. The hippopotamus is well known for being a grazer, known to eat a wide variety of plants. Analysis of mouth samples in 83 different hippopotami reveal 28 different grass species. Verse 16 describes the creature as being strong and having a big belly. One only needs to look at a sauropod, hippopotamus, or elephant to see why anyone would have considered these giants. All three are gigantic compared to humans. Verse 17 is stressed by creationists because it mentions the tail of the behemoth as moving like a cedar. Keep in mind that the length of the tail is not mentioned, it simply moves like a cedar. The cedar is a very stiff tree with plenty of bristles similar to the tail of a hippo or elephant. Also, the Hebrew word used is zanab, which can mean tail and or stump. Tail is the most likely translation, but it can pretty much mean any appendage. Also, the word moveth translates to the Hebrew word kaifates, meaning to take pleasure in. Piecing together all of these clues, we can make two conclusions. The behemoth's tail is described as having bristles and being stiff, like a cedar, or it is a euphemism. The elephant and hippopotamus fit this description better than a sauropod dinosaur, which probably had nothing similar to bristles to make it seem like a cedar. Verse 18 describes the animal as having strong bones. This can be used to describe all three candidates. Verses 19 and 20 pertain to the beast's glory and aren't very helpful in our search for identifying the behemoth. Verses 21 and 22 is where we get a clue to the size of the animal. It is large but still small enough to be overshadowed by trees. Also, the creature lives in swamps, as we can infer where the verse mentions a brook. Elephants are more suited to grasslands than swamps even though they can still live there, but the hippopotamus is clearly adapted to an aquatic life, even sleeping underwater in rivers and swamps. While the general idea of sauropods living underwater was scrapped decades ago, analysis of the stomach contents of an Egyptian sauropod called Paralititan shows it most likely lived in mangrove swamps. Verse 23 states that the creature drinks up a river, which most likely means it has a large, gaping mouth, something hippos have that sauropods and elephants do not have. Verse 24 doesn't seem very useful in identifying the animal either. Now let's see if the behemoth fits the description of any sauropod. As you can see, the only animal that has checked off each point on our checklist is the hippo, with the sauropod and elephant falling short. The behemoth is the hippopotamus. Now let's do the same for the leviathan. This is the entire chapter 41 of Job dedicated to the leviathan. The passage is very descriptive to the point where it's almost exaggerated. Let's make a checklist for the leviathan's traits. Firstly, it is aquatic. Secondly, it has thick skin. Thirdly, it is a very aggressive animal. Fourthly, it has large, terrifying, curved teeth. Fifthly, it has scales. Sixthly, and finally, it can breathe fire. The sixth claim throws us off because no animal, living or dead, is known to breathe fire. Let's start with the animals creationists will tag the leviathan. I will use Chronosaurus, which is not a dinosaur but rather a pliosaur, as the proxy of the leviathan. It definitely fits the description of the leviathan in the first sense. It was clearly adapted for marine life as we can see with its fins. As for the skin, we have no samples from prehistoric reptiles, so we can never be certain about its skin. We do, however, have skin impressions from sauropod dinosaurs, which suggests sauropods were scaly. One can speculate that Chronosaurus had similar scales, although one is a Lepidosaur and the other is an Archosaur. It is undoubtedly a large marine predator, perhaps the apex predator of its ecosystem. 
reaching 10.5 meters in length and weighing 11,000 kilograms, although that is the upper estimate and probably not the norm. All one needs to do is look at Kronosaurus fossils to see its teeth and see how dagger-like they are. No animal in history has ever been known to breathe fire. However, as I stated much, much earlier in the video, mist rising from the mouths of alligators could have inspired legends of fire-breathing dragons in China. Because I am unsure of any other reptilian doing this, I can't assume Kronosaurus is capable of the same behavior. The Nile crocodile would have been common in the Middle East near Egypt at this period of time. The crocodile is aquatic and has thick yet touch-sensitive skin with hard, bony plates beneath it. A study by Charles Darwin University confirms that baby saltwater crocodiles are born aggressive, ensuring their survival capability as fearsome hunters as they age. The saltwater crocodile has an incredible bite force of 16,460 newtons, and since the Nile crocodile is the second to th this crocodile in size, it's safe to assume Nile crocodiles have a smaller but still impressive bite force. Scales and teeth are evident on crocodiles, and finally, since the mist exhaling behavior I described earlier has only been observed in alligators, it would be unfair to give this point to the crocodile. With this evidence, it makes much more sense that the crocodile, not Chronosaurus or Lyplurodon or Elasmosaurus or Cryptoclitus or Dacosaurus or Symbospondylus or Tylosaurus or Mosasaurus or Halosaurus or any other prehistoric sea reptile is the Leviathan. Also, there's no good reason to say this creature can't be the Lotan. A seal from the ancient city of Eshinuna in Sumer dating back to 2200 BCE depicts presumably a great god or hero killing a serpent with seven heads. This is probably the origin of many myths of great gods or heroes killing creatures with seven heads, such as Baal and Yam, Heracles and the Lernian Hydra, and the seven-headed serpent of the Bible, so often associated with the Leviathan. As you can see, there's a recurring theme throughout the claims made in the video. The maker deceptively parrots stories from Paul Taylor's The Great Dinosaur Mystery, which essentially takes every dragon story it can find from ancient history and adds a fancy picture in which the dragon is an awkwardly drawn, outdated dinosaur. While I only reviewed a fraction of the claims in the video, you get the picture. The film conveniently leaves out most of the names of ancient texts that mention dragons. This is deceitful and unfair because it does not allow you to check your facts. What I did was search for the original text or source, or at least try to, and objectively prove that these are not dinosaurs. None of the artifacts shown are relevant to the creationist cause. I believe I have successfully disproved all the claims I chose to review, and the film pretty much lags on for a whole hour about either religion or false claims about artifacts and texts. However, the film also cites, quote, evidence that there is even a possibility that non-avian dinosaurs exist to the present day. Is this even possible? That's a video for another day. Thanks for watching.